Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this Energy Futures Lab uh, lunchtime webinar on the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on the electricity system. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who's Dr. Luis Bedesa, a research associate with the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at Imperial College. Luis's research uh, aims to facilitate a cost-effective integration of renewable energies, and specifically, he develops mathematical models uh, to operate electricity grids and markets efficiently uh, while guaranteeing that we're able to keep the lights on at all times. And today, of course, we're talking about keeping the lights on during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The last uh, year or, or more has affected all of us and uh, has touched every industry and every corner of the economy. And of course, the um, electricity system is no different. So the lockdowns created um, new conditions and new challenges uh, for the grid conditions that, as Luis will explain, uh, we perhaps didn't expect to see for uh, several years to come. And this topic is the subject of an Energy Futures Lab a white paper, which we will be uh, publishing in the coming months. Um, and Luis's work forms part of that. So if you haven't already, I would encourage you to uh, sign up to our mailing list uh, to hear about uh, that and our other work. Just before I hand over to Luis, um, a word about the format. So Luis will speak for around 25 or 30 minutes and then he'll take your questions. To submit a question, use the Q&A box, uh, which you'll find on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, so with that, I will hand over now uh, to Luis and say a very uh, warm welcome to Dr. Luis Fedesa. Thanks, Connor. So yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, so I guess you can see the slides. So uh, yeah, thanks again, Connor. So before I start the talk, just a bit more about my background. So I did my undergraduate studies at the University of Zaragoza in Spain. Then I did a master's degree at the University of Maine in the US. And last year I finished my PhD in electrical engineering uh, here at Imperial College. I also worked for some time as an energy consultant at ARU. And right now, like Connor said, I'm, I'm a research associate with the Control and Power Research Group. Here, my main line of research is about blackouts. In very short terms, uh, simple terms, I study how to avoid them and how we can pay as little as possible for avoiding them. And today I will be talking about the impact of COVID on the UK electricity system and what we can learn from this unique situation. So just a bit of a story about how this whole project started. Um, I was um, at home like most of you during the first lockdown in the UK in the spring of last year. And I had been reading and hearing a lot in the news about the dropping electricity demand. I had been already researching for a couple of years about operating systems with a lot of renewable energy. So I started asking myself if this was actually the first time that we were covering most of our demand with renewables and also how this period could give us information from a practical perspective on the future challenges of operating a decarbonized grid. So I decided to investigate it. Um, we had a little bit of a project with some collaborators and today I will share with you what uh, we found. This work, which I'll be summarizing today, has actually been published with a bit more detail in a paper in the journal Applied Energy. So if you're interested, you can find uh, many more details there. And just before I start the, the talk, I want to acknowledge the contribution of our collaborators from National Grid ESO and also the funding from Project IDLES, which studies the integrated development of low carbon energy systems. So this is how it all began. What you can see in the picture is the actual demand that we had last year during the lockdown compared to, um, well, it is the, the drop in demand compared to the, pre -ex to the expectation pre-pandemic from National Grid, from the system operator. This was not, um, this didn't just happen in the UK. It actually happened all over the world. Electricity demand dropped as lockdowns were in place in almost every country. And this, in turn, caused a drop in electricity prices. It had, had some consequences, as I will explain. Uh, we can see here that the highest drop uh, of instantaneous demand was of roughly 28%, and it happened on the Easter bank holiday weekend. Uh, 
And this was a record setting period. period. New records uh, occurred during this uh, lockdown period. The first of them was that we saw the lowest demand ever of 13.4 gigawatts of national demand overnight on Sunday, June 28th. We also experienced the lowest carbon intensity ever, um, which happened on May 24th, and it was of just 46 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour produced on the transmission network. And we also saw the longest cold-free period since the Industrial Revolution. For 68 consecutive days from April to June last year, we didn't use any coal at all to produce power in Great Britain. And this summarizes uh, quite nicely what actually happened, why all those records were broken. In simple terms, there was an operational challenge in the electricity, in the bridges electricity system, which is what I'll be discussing today. And this challenge was due to mainly three factors. The first of them, we had a depressed electricity demand, as we saw. Second, there was a typical power output from renewables in spite of the low electricity prices that were due to the low demand. This is because most renewables are shielded from low electricity prices due to their zero fuel costs and because some of them benefit from financial instruments such as contracts for differences. These financial instruments incentivize high energy output even if the price is low. And the third factor that was contributing to the operational challenge was that there was a typical power output from nuclear plants. These plants are also not significantly affected by market prices due to their inflexibility and also their low short-run marginal cost. So the consequences of these three factors were that we had two major sources of power during the lockdown, renewables and uh, nuclear. But operating the British grid with just these two sources is not yet possible. System stability would have been compromised due to something called inertia. Inertia would have been very low, and I will explain in a bit what that means. But for now, basically, keep in mind that inertia allows us to keep the system in balance. So what happened is that gas fire power plants had to be turned on to increase inertia. These were plants that were not successful in the wholesale energy market, which means that they were not needed for producing energy, but they were committed out of market simply for providing the needed inertia. This has a cost and it increases emissions simply for stability reasons. And now let me give some more details about the so-called stability actions that were taken during this period. So even before the lockdown started, National Grid ran some analysis to understand the challenge that the grid was expected to experience. This was because other countries were already in lockdown, like Italy and Spain, for example, and they had seen sharp drops in electricity demand. So in these studies, National Grid foresaw periods when it would be virtually impossible to guarantee system stability. They estimate that the capacity of synchronous units that are needed online to guarantee stability is of around 8 to 9 gigawatts. But the lowest possible demand expected during the summer of 2020, keep in mind that demand is lowest in Great Britain during the summer, typically. So this lowest expected demand was just above 12 gigawatts. And as I explained in the previous slide, given that renewables were expected to generate as usual, as well as about five gigawatts of nuclear power stations, there simply was not going to be enough inertia in the system. So uh, National Grid had to take a series of actions. And these are the four that you see there in the slide. The total cost of these stability actions exceeded 300 million pounds from May to July 2020. And this represents a threefold increase compared to the same period in 2019. So these stability actions were the first one. A new product was created, which was called Optional Downward Flexibility Management. And it was created to procure downward flexibility. The goal of this product was to either increase the demand of the transmission system 
or to decrease the amount of non-flexible providers that were outputting onto the system. This ODFM product provided a commercial route for providers with whom National Grid did not have a commercial agreement uh, previous to the lockdown. And the result was that over 4.5 gigawatts of assets signed up for this service, predominantly embedded wind and solar, but also a fair share of demand turn up assets. This ODFM service was used four times during the lockdown, with a total cost of the actions of approximately £7 million. And I think it's quite illustrative that three of these four ODFM instructions happened on the second bank holiday weekend in the month of May. Since demand for electricity is traditionally lowest in GP during bank holidays and weekends. So the second measure that was taken by the system operator by National Grid was to sign a bilateral contract with the largest nuclear power station. This largest plant um, very frequently defines the volume of ancillary services that we need. This is called the N minus one reliability requirement in the electricity sector, but it just means that if we have enough resources to cover for the largest possible loss of generation, in this case, this nuclear plant, we will keep system stability also for any other smaller loss. So through this contract, National Grid could instruct the power plant to have its output. And effectively, by part loading this unit, National Grid reduces the need for ancillary services because it reduces the size of this largest possible power loss, the, the worst possible contingency. The cost of this bilateral contract has been reported to be of up to 73 million pounds as the contract was extended until the end of September 2020. Then the third type of action that National Grid took to guarantee that system stability was going to be um, respected at all times, was to commit out of merit synchronous generators, as I explained in the previous slide. And just to give you one example on how this was done, 2.3 gigawatts of gas plants were brought online on the Easter Monday bank holiday with the purpose of increasing inertia. And finally, the fourth action taken was to create a fast track application for the accelerated loss of mains change program, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically it means that uh, through this program, embedded generators receive payments from National Grid to change their protection settings. And this is done so that they can stay connected to the grid under high rate of change of frequency conditions, basically when a large contingency happens. The program will be completed in coming years, but this fast track, which was created during the lockdown, had the goal of decreasing the need for inertia. So I've given you a summary of what happened, but does this operational challenge that we experience actually tell us anything about the future decarbonized grid? Well, we think so. And we think so because there are some expected trends um, that um, are foreseen for the future system. The first one is that there will be an increase in, in load, an increase in electricity demand. This is done through electrification of heat and transport. However, there will be an even higher rate of increase in renewable capacity. And the third factor, the thir third trend that we expect is that uh, there will be an increase in the largest possible loss due to commissioning of a large nuclear plant in Great Britain in coming years. So the consequence of these three trends will be low net demand. This means that uh, the volume of demand that must be covered by dispatchable units like gas fire power plants um, will be significantly lower than the one we've been used to experience. And this sounds very similar to what happened during the COVID lockdown. Therefore, we can infer that some of these challenges can be seen in the future system. And I will explain how we can do a bit of a more rigorous analysis to really understand what are the challenges uh, that we will be seeing. But first of all, let me go back a bit. Um, I will explain now in brief, uh, I will give a brief summary of the challenges for operating a grid dominated by renewables. 
the key concept for this challenge that I'll be explaining is inertia. Inertia means a physical inertia, which is a rotating mass, like the one you see there in the picture on the left side. So these rotating masses, uh, which um, we have in synchronous generators, like nuclear generators, like gas fire or coal fire power plants, the rotating mass acts as an energy buffer because it stores kinetic energy as it rotates to produce the power that we consume. This kinetic energy is spontaneously released to the grid when there is an imbalance between demand and generation. So in a sense, we could say that this inertia absorbs faults in the grid and therefore, in simple terms, it allows us to avoid blackouts. But uh, most renewables do not naturally provide inertia. It is very clear with a solar PV panel, like the one you see in the picture on the right, where there is clear, clearly there is no rotating mass. In wind turbines, it is true that there is a rotating mass, but it is decoupled from the grid through a power electronic converter. Therefore, it does not naturally provide this energy buffer. And as I said, inertia is needed because it allows us to keep the system in, in balance. When for whatever reason, there is an outage of a large generator in the system that causes a sudden imbalance between generation and demand. Imagine, for example, that a lightning strike forces a generator to disconnect from the grid. So in this situation, the inertia of the remaining synchronous generators starts to release kinetic energy and this compensates for the loss of uh, generation. As they release the kinetic energy, these rotating masses start to slow down. So the electric frequency that we see in the grid starts to decrease, which is what happens in, in that picture that you see in the slide. It would be dangerous if this frequency dropped too low. So the regulation in Great Britain states that it must be above 49.2 Hertz at all times. If it dropped below this value, some protection devices in the grid would start to disconnect loads and potentially we could even reach a full blackout situation. So in summary, we need inertia to avoid large frequency drops. A higher number of synchronous generators increases the system inertia, which is why National Grid had to turn on some gas plants during the lockdown. So to understand the future challenges of operating the decarbonized grid, we need to quantify how many ancillary services we will need. That is, how many of these stability actions will be required. The ancillary services are mainly inertia, but also something called frequency response, which is basically a power injection after a contingency happens. And this power injection is coming from different assets, such as generators and batteries. So the ancillary services can be thought of as a form of insurance that we have to prevent blackouts. For example, part loaded generators provide frequency response, but they operate at a lower than optimal power output. So this increases their per megawatt hour operating cost. The headroom in these part loaded generators provides this insurance in the form of frequency response that will act if a generation outage occurs. Another example of this insurance consists in committing out of merit thermal units to increase the system inertia. Because these thermal generators displace renewables, as we saw during the lockdown, which in turn increases the fuel costs in the system. For the study that I'm presenting today, we modeled the need for ancillary services into an economic optimization that minimizes operating costs in the British grid. This task is actually a bit challenging because we need to map the dynamics of ancillary services, which are described by differential equations, into an optimization problem based on algebraic equations. And another way of seeing this challenge is that we must map the sub-second timescale of a frequency drop into a bigger timescale of minutes or hours, like a typical wholesale electricity market clearing. And to project the need for future ancillary services, what we used was a frequency secured unit commitment model. The ancillary services dynamics are mapped into the optimization 
through the Rogoff and Nadir constraints, uh, this one's here. And I will explain them in a bit more detail in the next slide. But basically, these constraints guarantee that the solution of the optimization will um, respect stability no matter how large the contingency is. Also, this stochastic unit commitment allows us to capture the uncertainty in renewable generation. So the objective function of this optimization problem minimizes the expected value of system operating costs, which are basically fuel costs and startup costs. And the, fuel, the optimization also guarantees that the demand is met at all times. We use a scenario tree that considers a range of possible realizations of the renewable output, like the one uh, you see here in the picture. And the operating cost for each node in the tree is weighted by the probability of reaching that node. So the expected total cost is minimized. And we obtain the frequency stability constraints from the swing equation, which is the one you see there at the top of the slide. The swing equation is a reduced order model that represents the aggregated frequency dynamics of an electricity grid. And actually, the, the swing equation translates into this blur curve that you see there. That's the time domain solution of the swing equation. By solving the, this swing equation, we can obtain the conditions for guaranteeing that the Rokoff will not exceed a certain value. That's the derivative of the frequency, which is highest at the very instant of the, of the outage. And that the nadir will also not drop, drop below the acceptable limit. The nadir is basically the lowest point that the frequency reaches after a contingency. So the volume of the different ancillary services that help contain a frequency drop are co-optimized in the Rogoff and nadir constraints, which, which you see there in the slide. And we have obtained, like I said, from solving the swing equation. These ancillary services that we see appearing in the constraints are EFR, PFR, and the size of the, sorry, inertia also, and the size of the largest loss. So the unit commitment guarantees that, like I said, there are enough resources like inertia and frequency response, so that if there was a sudden generation loss, the system would still maintain stability. And just a brief explanation of EFR and PFR. EFR stands for enhanced frequency response. This is a fast power injection from devices like batteries, which help restore the generation demand balance. And PFR is the same thing, but it's a bit slower. It stands for primary frequency response, and it is provided mainly by synchronous generators, which are slower. So therefore it takes some more time to provide this full power injection. So we simulated one year of operation of the British electricity system using this uh, frequency secured stochastic unit commitment. We used an hourly resolution and a rolling planning approach in which one scenario tree was built each hour with a 24 hour look ahead. All constraints in the optimization were linear except the Nadir constraint, which I showed in the previous slide, which was a second order cone but still convex, therefore yielding a, an efficient optimization problem. And here are some results. By running the unit commitment model, we can obtain the projected operating costs of the future British electricity system. What we used for this base case that you see in the picture is national grids leading the way scenario, which is one of the scenarios that national grid ambitions as possibilities as how the British um, electricity and energy system will evolve into the future. In this case, this leading the way scenario um, considers a carbon neutral electricity system by 2030. So in this scenario, we consider 30 gigawatts of solar PV, 68 gigawatts of wind and 14 gigawatts of storage of which more than uh, nine gigawatts are battery storage. What you can see there in the graph are the projected costs for energy and ancillary services. Basically, how we obtained the cost for ancillary services was by running two unique commitment problems. One with the stability constraints integrated in it and another one without. The difference in cost between these two simulations gave us the 
cost of ancillary services. What we can see from the results is that there is a clear reduction in total OPEX from what we saw in 2015. But we also see that the cost for ancillary services increases and it reaches 15% of total OPEX in this base case. So in coming slides, I will show some sensitivities that explain the main drivers for this increased cost for ancillary services. One of the main reasons for the results you just saw is the radical change that we will see in system inertia. We are going to see lower inertia on the road to lower emissions. Inertia used to be a byproduct of energy because it was naturally provided by thermal generators, as you can see there in the distribution for system inertia in 2016. But it is becoming more and more an insurance. We have to pay for it independently from energy, and we need it to absorb the faults that might happen in the system. In the blue distribution, which is the projection from our model for 2030, the low values of inertia mean that thermal plants are committed at times when they are not really needed for energy, but they are needed to guarantee stability. And to clarify a bit more the annual distribution that I just showed for 2030, here is an example of a week of operation of the system. The first two days of this week show periods of high net demand when the gas plants increase their power output to cover the system demand. On the other hand, the last three days show periods of zero net demand when there is renewable curtailment for a sustained period. So even though in these days all the demand could be covered by non-synchronous renewables, a minimum number of gas plants is kept online to provide inertia. And another major driver for the total cost of ancillary services is fast frequency response, which, like I said, can be provided by some devices like batteries. Our results show that high volumes of EFR available have a very positive influence in reducing costs. On the other hand, if only 500 megawatts were available, the cost of ancillary services would be of 2 billion pounds per year in the case that we studied or 35% of the total system OPEX. And to give you some context, during lockdown, there was around 200 megawatts of EFR available. But National Grid currently plans to procure around one gigawatt by summer this year. And now let me show you an example of what can happen if there aren't enough ancillary services, because we actually experienced it in Great Britain in August 2019, when more than 1 million customers lost power and there was significant disruption to rail services in the Friday evening commute, as you can see there in the picture. This event on 2019 was caused by a lightning strike in the grid, which basically forced two large power plants to trip, a gas plant and an offshore wind farm. The subsequent drop in frequency in the grid also caused disconnection of some distributed generation, which made the power loss even larger. There were simply not enough ancillary services to secure this large outage, so the frequency kept dropping and some load was disconnected. So as we expect significant electrification to reduce emissions, particularly electrification of heat and transport, we are going to become even more dependent on electricity. Therefore, avoiding blackouts will be even more critical. So we decided to study the implications of having enough ancillary services to cover an N-2 loss like this one in 2019. It's basically the simultaneous loss of two generators because right now it's typical practice in most countries to just cover for the loss of the largest possible unit, the N-1 reliability requirement. And here are the results. We considered an N minus two loss driven by a large nuclear plant and an HVDC interconnector with France. So this summed up to a total of 2.8 gigawatts compared to the 1.8 of the N minus one loss of just the nuclear plant. You can see that covering an N minus two event increases costs uh, exponentially. 
we also studied a case in which um, we used an optimal loss sizing strategy. And we have a bit more details in the paper on what that means. But basically what um, the optimization is doing in this strategy is to part load these drivers of the largest loss if it's cost, if it's cost effective for the overall system. For example, if there is a lot of renewable output at a given time, it might be cost effective from a system perspective to part load some big nuclear plant or some large interconnector because that reduces the need for ancillary services. These plants or these interconnectors typically provide cheap energy, but in times of high renewable output, more cheap energy is not really needed. So with this optimal loss sizing strategy, the cost of an N minus two security can actually be very significantly reduced. It is true that this is a bit of an ideal case, which assumes uh, co-optimization of ancillary services and energy markets, which is not currently happening in the system. So further work would be necessary to understand how we could take advantage of strategies like this. However, let me say that it's also true that there are other options that could reduce the cost for ancillary services in the future and not just this part loading of large units. Uh, for example, once electric vehicles are widely available, uh, several of them could provide vehicle to grid services. And actually some colleagues in our group have demonstrated that this could be a very valuable service. And another major option to reduce the cost of ancillary services is to unlock the use of synthetic inertia from wind turbines which is not currently used in Great Britain. Um, there are still some uncertainties surrounding the capabilities of synthetic inertia, such as how could we know exactly the number of turbines available at a given time. But uh, some re previous modeling results from our group show that this technology could be very valuable, like the results that you can see there in the picture. And I'm reaching now the end of the presentation, and I would just uh, say that the key takeaways of this work are first, that the GV electricity system experienced an operational challenge during the first COVID-19 lockdown due to low inertia. Second, that the cost of ancillary services during lockdown was three times higher than in 2019, and the total exceeded 300 million pounds. This cost could reach up to 35% of total OPEX by 2030, but steps are being taken to avoid such high increase. And finally, fast frequency response shows to be very beneficial in the future system. So to summarize, we have shown that the lockdown measures following the COVID-19 outbreak has provided some very valuable insights on the practical challenges of operating a system dominated by renewables. And while this is true, it is true that uh, these challenges had already been predicted, it, they were not expected until some years in the future, once the penetration of renewables keeps increasing to reduce emissions. The exceptional circumstances of the pandemic, which caused this sharp drop in electricity demand that we saw, have shown that these challenges are very much real and not just theoretical results coming from our models. And while we have focused our study on the British grid, these learnings can also be useful to other countries. It is true that managing the GV system will likely be more challenging than managing continental grids, because it is an island where the low inertia problem is already present. But continental grids will very likely experience these challenges too, once renewable penetration is sufficiently high in all the interconnected countries. And that's it from me today. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Luis. And just a reminder uh, to everyone that you can submit your questions in the Q&A box uh, on the right hand side of the screen. Um, so I think everybody would agree that was a really interesting uh, uh, presentation, a very clear presentation. Uh, and I can see that there's already questions coming in. So Luis, I might hand straight back to you and uh, you can uh, take those in in whatever order you uh, you prefer. OK, so yeah, let me open the Q&A. So I see a question from Rob saying, why does solar have inertia in winter, yet none in summer? Um, 
not sure I understand what this question means because what we assumed in the model is that solar PV basically does not have any inertia. What I tried to explain in the presentation was that demand in the system is lowest during summer, therefore net demand um, is also lowest. Net demand is the volume of demand that we can cover from dispatchable sources, which are the main providers of inertia. Solar PV panels do not have any rotating mass, so well, this is an active area of research, but if we included some storage connected to it, they could potentially provide some synthetic inertia, although of course adding this storage would increase the investment costs. So in summary, solar does not provide inertia either in summer, nor in winter. Um, so the next question uh, is, the system strength also reduces on the way to lower emissions. In that case, there is no guarantee to have EFR from batteries. Does your modeling miss something? Uh, I'm also not sure I understand this because EFR is basically a product created by National Grid by which EFR providers, so this is a technology agnostic product. The requirements are just that, well, right now, actually this uh, service is being migrated into something called dynamic containment, which has um, a similar speed requirement. The providers have to deliver fast power injections in the next second following a power outage. So this service is actually an auction. There's a market and providers get paid to provide this service. Um, batteries are actually the ones most successful in this market and they, they get paid. It's actually right now one of their uh, main revenue streams. So it is expected that this product or something similar will be there in the future. And we run sensitivities on the volume of EFR there that we have. And that's why we saw these different costs for ancillary services, depending on the volume of EFR. So we have um, another question, which is actually two parts. The first one is what could be potential countermeasures of low inertia for the future system? Can you specifically comment on the countermeasures of keeping thermal plants in the system? Well, a very clear one is um, EFR. It's not as effective as inertia because basically the Rogoff cannot be so effectively contained by EFR. But given that it is a very fast power injection, inertia in a sense is still a power injection. It's just that it comes from the kinetic energy stored in the masses and it's instantaneous because of the laws of physics. But EFR would be a very effective countermeasure. There is actually a stability pathfinder project by National Grid which is investigating, um, well, it has actually created a tender for providers of inertia, which have zero power output. So it would not come from thermal units and the technology that was successful in this tender were synchronous compensators, which we could think of as um, synchronous motors. So we have a rotating mass, it's just, um, it is neither producing nor consuming energy. Well, a very negligible amount of energy. So these ones provide inertia and some other services like short circuit current. So that's one of the possibilities going forward for not only the frequency stability, but other types of stability in a highly renewable system. And also the second part of this question was, what is the current largest loss of infeed in the UK? Uh, this varies because it depends on the producer, the largest producer at any given time. But as far as I know, it could be a nuclear plant that is uh, that drives a loss of around 1.3 gigawatts. Or also one of the interconnectors with France is sometimes the driver with uh, the driver of the largest loss, and that's still above one gigawatt. So the next question was: inertia from wind turbines would have significant mechanical stress on turbines. How likely it would be to see synthetic inertia from wind? So yeah, this is a very interesting question that however, I don't have an answer for because what are we focus in our, in our analysis is to understand the system value of these technologies, say EFR, um, synthetic inertia from wind, frequency response from EVs, etc. We do not get into actually how that would affect the devices. 
for doing a cost benefit analysis, we would provide basically the benefits side of it and um, technology manufacturers or mechanical engineers can actually quantify what would be the, the mechanical stress or the degradation in batteries. And then we could actually um, see the costs that the devices would incur when providing these services. So the next question was, the next question was, could excess rest be diverted to, for example, um, hydrogen production to keep rest running? Sure, this is a possibility. For our modeling purposes, it would basically mean that the demand is increased in the system. However, let's assume that um, demand is low and we increase the demand by using, by turning on electrolyzers during this period, demand increases. But still, what we care about is net demand for the ancillary services. So we would still need some inertia in the system, even if the demand has increased. Because if demand increases, but we keep um, covering that demand from non-synchronous renewables, as of now, the system stability could still be compromised. So the next question was, can nuclear plants provide inertia? Yes, they can. They are synchronous generators and they do provide this valuable service. And so in the, so just to give an example, what happened during last year when we had renewables and nuclear basically as the main power sources, nuclear was providing inertia, but it was not enough from what National Grid um, analyzed that would be needed in the system. And that's why some gas plants had to be turned off. Next question, regarding the stochastic unit commitment, when you look at a shorter time scale, one week, one day ahead, time horizon, does a deterministic unit commitment have an edge over stochastic one? Just by trusting the forecast wind and solar inputs, assuming both cases, stochastic versus deterministic, include frequency stability constraints, etc. So yeah, the, the comparison between deterministic and stochastic is actually a very interesting one, which was uh, analyzed in detail in our group a couple of years ago. Uh, my work basically consists on including frequency stability constraints into our unit commitment models. What was shown, so we use this rolling planning approach in the stochastic unit commitment in which um, right now we build the scenario tree for the next 24 hours taking into account the forecast for renewables, but also some forecast error, which allows us to build a scenario tree. And we minimize the expected cost. We only take the here and now decision. So we minimize for the expected cost in the next 24 hours, but we only take the decision for the current time node. Then in the next hour, we build a new scenario tree and we again repeat the process. The comparison with a deterministic model was that, um, well, it's actually quite difficult to forecast particularly wind in the day ahead. So if we moved the electricity markets clearing very, very close to real time, maybe this stochastic versus deterministic comparison would somehow disappear, but that's not practical for many reasons. So our, the previous study in our group showed that using a deterministic scheduling in a system with a lot of renewables increases uh, the costs quite significantly by three or four percent of total costs just because you need to be conservative in the amount of reserve that you need. Reserve is similar to frequency response, it's just it doesn't really matter if, it's, if it is as fast as one or ten seconds, it can be a matter of minutes, but we still need to get some keep some headroom in the thermal units. So if we use a deterministic unit commitment, we need to be a bit more conservative and keep extra headroom just in case. But if you're interested, I suggest you read uh, some of the papers from our group on this topic. So the next question, um, I would be pleased if you could share the details for the paper published in Applied Energy that you mentioned. Uh, sure, um, I'll share the slides with Connor. I'll include a link to my homepage. I put there all my papers in, so the preprints are in open access and you can see all the details of this paper and any others there. 
Next question, did your model consider transmission constraints? So yeah, this is a good question. No, we didn't. Um, the argument is that for the scheduling problem, we care mostly about the commitment decision of the generators. Therefore, we assume a copper plate model. Uh, in practice, what would be done is that with that decision, with, with that uh, solution of the, of the commitment decision, we would then run some, for example, optimal power flow or some problem that guarantees that the transmission constraints are respected. So we would change a little bit the solution, but this still gives us a general idea of what the costs are going to look like. Next question, could you please elaborate on the recommendations for GB system to reduce the cost, for example, of ancillary services of a stable grid? Um, well, like I said, I mean, there are many options out there and uh, National Grid takes the approach of creating these technology agnostics, agnostic markets. Um, they do run very extensive studies and some of their conclusions seem to agree with the ones that we have reached. For example, I know that they are um, aiming to procure more EFR, more of this well, dynamic containment, this uh, fast frequency response which agrees with the cost savings that we've seen in our in our model. But um, that's basically a general recommendation that we see from our results. The system is going to have much faster dynamics because we don't have these slow thermal plants, so we will have fewer of them. Power electronics are much faster. Therefore, having faster countermeasures typically reduces the cost because slower actions such as traditional primary frequency response is not as effective and that's reflected in the cost. Um, next question, what was the highest percentage in any hour of renewables? When in planning, what is the method for derating renewables to account for their intermittency? So for renewables, we considered um, some profiles, some capacity factors, the highest percentage in any hour, as I showed in some of the slides, was actually negative net demand or well zero. But still we needed some floor of inertia, which in this case in the modeling was provided by gas plants with carbon capture and storage. So that's how we account for renewables. Then how difficult is it for wind and solar energy to provide the virtual and synthetic inertia needed? Are the barriers technical or regulation market? Well, as of now, actually there does not exist a market for inertia, um, not in GB. There is some product in Ireland in which plants get paid for inertia. Not sure if virtual inertia is included there at this point, although I'm sure the plants are to consider it. But basically, inertia is still somehow thought of, a, of, of uh, as a byproduct of energy because it still comes from thermal units that are there to provide energy. So that's one market barrier. Um, renewables are right now not incentivized to provide inertia. Why would they do it if they are not going to be paid for it? There might be some mechanical stress uh, as some of the, the questions um, uh, raised here in the chat. So that's one. There are some technical barriers. Yes, there are, um, although they are less and less because there has been extensive research in this area and the power electronics converters could be controlled so that um, inertia is unlocked from these devices. The difference between wind and solar is that solar does not have any storage in it. Inertia needs some energy storage. Wind does have storage because it has a rotating mass, so it's, it um, stores kinetic energy. Solar would need some kind of storage if it was going to provide virtual inertia. So the next question is, could you discuss about solving the optimization model and the software used? So the optimization model, like I said, is um, well, it's actually a second order cone program because of that nadir constraint. It is a convex optimization problem. <clears throat> for these results, we relaxed the binary variables for the commitment decision. So basically, the commitment of a generator is a zero or one decision. That complicates the optimization a bit because solving the 
so-called mixed integer programs is significantly more, um, it takes significantly more computational resources than, than simply complex programs. However, it can be done for mixed integer linear programs or even mixed integer second order codes, but uh, we relaxed it for um, efficiency purposes. The optimization is quite fast to solve. So for the whole year of operation, we can solve it in uh, between 30 and 45 minutes. Then we run sensitivities and we, we repeat the optimization, of course. How we model it is um, we have a C++ framework, which then calls uh, an optimization solver, in this case, FICO Express, which is the one that does the low level numerical um, algorithms for us. And if you're interested, I suggest you can check some of our papers for a bit more detail. The next question, how many megawatts of battery storage are there on the system and are they used for anything other than frequency regulation? So if I remember correctly, there were around nine gigawatts of battery storage. And yes, they are used for other things than frequency regulation. Actually, only a percentage of them were used for frequency regulation because of the volumes that we assume National Grid would procure in the future. Other things that they are used for is energy arbitrage. They charge when it's cheap, they discharge when it's uh, when energy is expensive, and they can also provide reserve in the stochastic unit commitments. So yeah, that's a, an important point. In this modeling, all these services are co-optimized. Energy and ancillary services are co-optimized, and um, every asset is used in an optimal way from the system perspective to provide all of these services. The next question is, you are giving stability costs as a proportion of operating costs, but the overall costs will be increasing, will be increasingly a matter of the return on capital costs. How much does stability rise as a proportion of these overall costs? Uh, sure, this is a very clear point. We don't get into investment costs in this model because we only study the operational aspects of the system. Um, some other work in our group deals with an optimal capacity expansion uh, policy, for example. So for the point of batteries, um, it's true that they have no fuel costs in our, in our model. Um, they do provide this uh, very valuable service, but they would have some uh, significant investment costs. We comment on this in the paper. These are the operational savings that we could get from these assets. They should be paid for them, of course, because it benefits the system. And an investment model could see um, how cost effective it is to, to actually invest in these technologies based on the expected return that they will get from these services. Uh, however, that being said, for the volumes that we considered, which were from 500 megawatts to 1.500 gigawatts of EFR, that's pretty close to what we are already seeing that uh, National Grid expect to procure as of now, as of this year. So by 2030, I think it's fairly reasonable to expect that, um, that it is profitable for investors in battery storage to, to provide these services. Next question, will greater number of interconnectors to the UK challenge the stability of the UK system? Mm, that's, um, I don't have a simple answer for that. So on the one hand, uh, let's say that we are importing all of our energy at a given time from interconnectors with um, different European countries. Interconnectors are in fact power electronics devices. They are HVDC cables with power electronics on, on both ends. It is true that they could provide some services similar to the synthetic inertia, but if they don't, we would still need some inertia. So from a stability perspective, it would be difficult to operate um, the system when it is importing 100% of its, of its energy from HVDC interconnectors. That's still a I think not a very realistic scenario. A more realistic one would be a scenario in which we are 
covering part of our energy with renewables and also importing part of our energy from abroad, still all those sources would be non-synchronous, we would need some inertia. So in summary, I don't think it would increase the stability challenge of the UK system and there are several benefits of um, a highly meshed system, particularly for energy purposes, but it is something that uh, would have to be taken into account. Well, another key point is that some of these interconnectors are quite big, so they could be sometimes the drivers of the largest possible loss. In that sense, yes, they could they could increase the challenge for stability. The next question is, green hydrogen is the current hot topic. Have you considered reversible electrolyzers as a potential grid service for 2030? That is, producing electricity when frequency losses happen. The time of response um, is already under, from 0 to 100%, is already under 200 milliseconds. Um, I know that this is a very discussed topic right now. Um, I'm not sure about those technical characteristics that are mentioned around of under 200 milliseconds, but assuming that that's the case, this could be very um, good candidates for the EFR service. So, um, Yes, there could be some synergies of producing green hydrogen at times of low net demand. If they could provide the fast frequency response service when there is a contingency. We haven't considered that in the model, but it will translate into basically a bit more EFR. Next question, is the current response time of EFR, FFR? By the way, so this is my comment. FFR is what I called PFR in in the slides, just because PFR is a bit more widely used in other countries, but in the, in Great Britain, it's typically called in market arrangements FFR, which is firm frequency response. So the question was, is the current response time of EFR and uh, PFR sufficiently for very low inertia conditions, or they need to be used with other countermeasures? So PFR and very low inertia is not a sustainable operating condition that was shown already in some previous work from our group because we would need huge volumes of uh, PFR given that it takes up around 10 seconds for full delivery. Uh, EFR is very fast, it probably cannot get much faster than that because um, we still need to be careful with the controls so they, that they don't react too aggressively to minor faults. Um, however, is that sufficient for very low inertia conditions? Well, we pro will probably still need some, some inertia because of uh, containing the rock off in the very first instant of the fault. That's, yeah, that's a summary of um, how I see we will have to operate moving forward. So I'm conscious we're reaching the end of the, of the webinar. Um, okay, I'll just go in order. I'll take maybe one more question, Connor, is that fine? So it was, why do you believe that batteries have typically won the EFR auctions? Well, it's not that I believe it, it's that that's the reality, that's, that's what happened. And are gas plants able to provide FR in the time required by EFR? No, they are not. Because of the dynamics, we have a uh, rotating mass there, we have um, mechanical parts that cannot give that, so the, the governor control of uh, thermal vents cannot, they're simply physical limits and they cannot be as fast as the EFR service. Um, okay, so I think that's it. Super, uh, we're right, right up to one o'clock. So I'll, I'll just uh, wrap up very briefly and, and say thank you to you, uh, Luis, for, for that uh, really great presentation and, and um, for taking all of those questions. And thank you to everyone who joined us today and uh, for submitting those questions. And just briefly to, to remind you that um, uh, the Louise's work will form part of a white paper uh, which will be published by IDLES, uh, the IDLES program Energy Futures Lab uh, in the coming months so do keep an eye out for that uh, and Louise will also be appearing on um, our uh, new podcast series Low Carbon Conversations with uh, Cormac O'Malley. Uh, the first episode of that with Mar Dr Marco Onedi is available now um, on Spotify, Apple Music, and all the places that you would uh, usually get your, your podcasts. And it's also available on the Energy Futures Lab um, website. And if you do want to take a look back at any of our previous uh, webinars, they're available on our YouTube channel. 
the recording of this webinar will also be available there uh, and we'll send you the, the link in case you want to watch it back or uh, share it with anyone else and we'll send you that with the, uh, the slides from today and the link uh, to the paper that this webinar was based on. Uh, but thank you again for joining us and thank you, Luis. Uh, we'll leave it there and uh, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you everyone for